Dr. Miles? Here. Mrs. Murphy? Here. Ms. Perry? Here. Mrs. Shea? Here. Ms. Hobbs? Here. Ms. Hartle? Here. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Are there any adjustments to the agenda? Um, I have a brief announcement that I'd like to add somewhere in the agenda if that's possible. Okay, we'll find a place to put that in okay. just in a couple of minutes. Um, the adjustment to the, ad uh, the agenda is on uh, in new business 5.0 and we're adding 5.7 which is high school spring athletic appointments. And I believe that Kelly is giving you the support the supporting material. That was... Um, a little bit late to us. Right, yeah. That's it. All right, 5.0 new business, 5.1. The meeting minutes from March 24th. Is there a motion? Move approval is printed. Second. Any discussion, corrections, additions? Seeing none, all in favor? Seven plus two. 5.2, the second reading of policy JLAL, which is the wellness policy. Mrs. Murphy, do you want to say anything about it before we begin? Um, just, there is one um, just typographical situation on page three. The cross-references cross were inserted there instead of at the end, but that is the only thing. <coughs> is there a motion? Move approval is printed. Second. Is there any further discussion? Yeah. It would be move approval as adjusted, correct? As adjusted? I think it's, it's just, yeah, it's it was just, just inserted. Yeah, it was just inserted in the <coughs> wrong place. <coughs> Anyone? Discussion? Yeah, let's check. You did, okay. Very good, then all in favor? Seven plus two. Okay. 5.3 is a donation from the Seaport Credit Union for the Wentworth School. Dr. This is um, a donation that supports a field trip to the Ecology School in Saco, Maine for, for our fifth graders happening on June 6th. And the Seaport Credit Union uh, stepped up uh, to make a nice donation of $1,500 to offset the full cost of the trip. So we certainly want to extend our gratitude to Amber Earl, uh, who's very active in this community. Um, and she's also the local Seaport branch manager um, to her and her staff for this wonderful partnership and continued support. So the recommendation would be to accept this generous donation with appreciation. So move. Second. Any discussion? None at all. Thank you very much. All in favor. Seven plus two. Thank you. And thank you to the credit union. Mm -hmm. uh, 5.5, the school board's adoption of the... 5.4. 5 5.4, 5 sorry. Middle school spring athletic appointment. They are as presented in your packet on um, two appointments. And is there a motion? Approval, approval as presented. Second. Any discussion? Any questions? Christine? I feel the need mm -hmm. um, to inquire what else do we have coming up from the middle school for any we're, kind of appointment? We're uh, done. This is it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? It's these oh. two that we received originally plus the three tonight. That's right. 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 Those are for the high school. Those are different. Oh. They're 5.7. Oh, sorry. Does everybody get those? <coughs> another place. Yeah, they're another <laughs> Great. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> All in favor of the middle school spring athletic appointment. Seven plus two. Thank you. 5.5. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak on the calendar? Would you please come up to the podium and... There's no mic. Oh, there's no mic on, so maybe just Here. say your name no, and yeah, there you, you go. can do it from that corner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Our new podium. That's, that's, that's actually really good. That's a Thank good thought. My name is Michelle Markham. Uh, I'd like to re I respect all the hard work that the school board and the administrators have done for Scarborough School. 
I'd like to voice my concern for the three choices of the draft calendars for the 2016-17 school year presented for final approval, all of which increase the number of late starts for the high school only over the current year. As you know, draft number three has an increase of nine Wednesdays, number four has an increase of 16 Wednesdays, and number five has an increase of 12 Wednesdays. My greatest concern is increasing the number of late starts at the high school only is the lack of the bus transportation to coincide with the start of the school day. On school days that are designated a high school only late start, the only available bus transportation drops off the high school students at 7.30 in the morning and they can then sit in the cafeteria until school officially starts at 9 a.m. If the days designated as teacher professional development for the high school only occurred as an early release instead of a late start, then there would be adequate time in the day to allow for a bus run to bring those high school students home. Presently, approximately 20% of the high school students take the buses on a regular basis in addition to the parents dropping students off at school for inconvenience by the late start. Furthermore, by having a high school only late start every Wednesday does not provide consistency for all of the students and families since the bus transportation coinciding with the start of the school day would only occur once a month. In the past, the public has asked if we must have the late starts to have them on a Monday or a Friday so the students can have less of an impact on their sleep schedule. We were told that the Scarborough needs to have them on the Wednesday to coincide with Westbrook schools since we have students that take classes at Westbrook. Yet the Westbrook schools have a one hour early release every Wednesday this school calendar year and for next year also. I'm having a difficult time understanding how Wednesdays can be productive for the students from Scarborough who take classes in Westbrook. If Scarborough High School were to have early release on Wednesdays, it would coincide with the Westbrook schools, it would allow us time for a bus run to take students home, and it would allow students increased opportunities to utilize their time. If you must utilize the late start, Fridays may actually work as a great late start for high school students since many of them either work on a Friday night, have sporting events, or go out with friends. And since the studies have shown that they're safer driving with adequate sleep, Friday would more likely be the night they're out driving rather than the Wednesday nights and could therefore benefit from the additional sleep. So to summarize, my request to the school board are please change late starts to early release. Please offer the bus transportation for the high school students to coincide with the school start and end time. And if you must have a late start, please change them to Mondays or Fridays to have less of a disruption of sleep schedules on students and allow their schedule to benefit from a late start. Thank you again for all of your significant efforts to make Scarborough schools great. I am very proud of the Scarborough schools. Please take into consideration the impact of the students and their best interest when considering the school calendar. I really do love Scarborough schools. I'm just really not a big fan of the late start. And thanks again for all your time and consideration. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public who wishes to speak? Very well. We'll move on. So at this point, um, I'm going to ask Dr. Entwistle to just um, take a look at those three, the, the, the um, sample three, four, and five, and run down a little bit of information you have for us there so that we can just kind of review this before we... <coughs> right. Um, so the draft that you're most familiar with is draft three. This was brought um, up as the recommended uh, school calendar for next year by the uh, Leadership Council and uh, by me. Um, draft four was created uh, to have an option that would essentially create a late start on every Wednesday and some of the concern had to do with uh, the regularity or the, the calendaring um, and um, basically by making it every Wednesday there was never any question as to whether or not it was a late start. And draft five was um, a third option which was really intended to um, create some predictability in the calendar while at the same time minimizing the amount of um, instructional time that um, was being impacted. When we brought forth uh, draft three, we felt that to be our best um, opportunity to accomplish the work that the high school needs to accomplish. And there's some they've got they've got big uh, they've got a big plate of work to do, um, while at the same time keeping to a minimum the impact on 
um, instructional time. Uh, draft four uh, really um, basically uh, adds uh, a 16 additional high school only late starts. Uh, in taking a look at draft five and in speaking one, with one of the board members today who showed me that um, the, there was a, a bit of an error <coughs> on, on this. Um, and so the copy that you have is now corrected. The first correction that needs to be noted is that graduation is not on June 4th, but on June 11th. Um, so you should see that reflected on the calendar that you're looking at. Um, the other uh, change that needed to be made in order to have a late start, but, but no late starts on any day, any week where there was a Monday or a Friday holiday, there was a bit of a mistake on, in January because January 18th was uh, listed as a NEASC late start and in fact that was inconsistent with the model that we were creating. So this piece that says calendar uh, and it has my initials at the bottom with today's date basically modifies um, the description specifically of draft five. Again, it's created as an alternative to draft four, seeking to add the needed time in a predictable fashion, while at the same time limiting the impact on instructional time. This draft adds not nine, but eight additional NEASC high, high school only late starts. January and June are the exceptions to that rule. However, <coughs> no late starts are scheduled in any week that has an already scheduled holiday. They're mostly on Mondays and there's one that's on a Friday. To accomplish this, one late start in October simply shifted from October 12th to October 19th and two, not three, additional late starts are added on the two open non-holiday weeks. This draft adds only two additional late starts beyond the eight NEASC late starts for a total of ten additional high school only late starts. Again, it's um, a, a, a bit of a modification from draft three, easy to follow because if there's a holiday cancels a late start on Wednesday and it results in eight, I mean, I'm sorry, it results in a total of 10 additional high school only late starts. Um, so this would allow high school students uh, a late start every week between, I mean, either a holiday or a late start every week between the start of school and June 7th, 2017, which would provide at least one day per week of that extra sleep. And I think we are, and I know the board is sensitive to the fact that transportation might be an issue. And I know that there's a commitment to look at that and remedy that if we, if, if we can do that at all. And, and maybe a board member will wish to speak to that. Um, so we would recommend now that the board either adopt draft three, which is the original, or uh, draft five. And I'm happy to answer any questions. When you work with this enough, it will make you crazy. Okay, so that's the point on that, but I think I can still explain any one of these things. So I move approval of draft five as presented here tonight. Second. Is there any discussion? Jackie? Yes, I, I would like uh, either Superintendent Ed Whistle or Principal Creech to address why Mondays and Fridays are not appropriate for, for this work and why we have the, the early, uh, the late starts as opposed to early release. Well, I can take on the late starts versus early release. I think we, when we looked at um, the success of early releases, and there's a lot of history to look at, um, it actually creates a, um, a significant amount of um, unsupervised time for students just in general, because they're being released about partway through the day, and in a normal work day, it's several, it's multiple hours that students could potentially not be supervised or parents have to arrange for supervision. 
I think that also at the end of the day, uh, the professional development uh, generally get, uh, has a lagged start because teachers are very engaged in their day. They're trying to return emails. They're trying to, you know, catch up with a parent or catch up with a colleague and so on. So typically, whatever the amount of time is that we were supposed to have for professional learning gets shrunk by, by that. Um, so that was the, in the, in the final analysis, <coughs> impacted instructional time less. It created um, less unsuper or potentially unsupervised time for kiddos and it created a higher quality learning experience for teachers. Um, Joanne is the person who coordinates things with the, all of the vocational schools and so I, I'd ask her to speak to the day of the week. Our commitment is to uh, Wednesday for the uh, Westbrook, Wyndham, Gorm, and Barney Eagle. And that is the day that we have all agreed upon that we would have our professional development day. If it was going to be late start, early release, whatever, but Wednesday is the day that we committed to. Thank you. Any other questions? Jody and then Kate? Um, I first wanted to say to Michelle, we've heard <coughs> you and, and we appreciate you coming and, and continuing to sort of uh, speak and voice your concern on this. We've talked about bus transportation for the high school and <coughs> have committed, I believe, to looking into, we're looking at the whole bus um, transportation issue this summer because we're also committed to later start times and in, in doing all of that. So this summer, transportation is priority <coughs> number one. And that includes later starts in general, but also figuring out how can we provide bus transportation <coughs> with limited buses. I mean, frankly, it costs a lot of money to get more buses. So our, our trouble with late start high school only is that they're going at the same time as another school. So what we've sort of talked about very sort of preliminary and just trying to figure out how can we work through this is coming up with a way that it becomes almost a commuter style bus in that it will be a different route for those high school kids on those Wednesdays. It will be, it won't adhere to the you have to be within a half a mile and all of that. It will be more com commuter style where maybe we only have to send out three buses, one to the Pleasant Hill area, one to the Blue Point area, and one to the Eight Corners area. That's very general. We're just sort of brainstorming and trying to figure <coughs> out because you're not the only one that's voiced that concern. So I think that's where we're at mm -hmm. and you know can't really commit much further than that, but I think it's a good first step to figuring out how to allow all kids to have a little bit extra sleep in the next school. Okay. I just want to thank you all so much for your hard work. I know that this has been just a bear, and um, and I really love <laughs> Schedule 5. I think the two things that we absolutely know about students is, first of all, they benefit highly from as much routine and regularity as they can have in their lives, and I think this presents that to a much greater degree. And and I think we do know that, that high school students benefit from later starts whenever possible, and I think this moves towards it. So um, I just want to applaud you for doing this, and thank you. I, I'm a convert. I was highly critical, and um, I'm very very much in favor of this. Kelly? Um, just one other thing about Wednesdays instead of Mondays or Fridays. Um, we as a district tried early release on Fridays and um, attendance was abysmal at <coughs> every phase level because people didn't take it seriously as a school day and they would just blow it off. So switching to Wednesdays, <coughs> especially for late starts, it's more natural of a school day. People don't tend to just Take off a Wednesday um, to go away, and it's what Dr. Entrez was saying about the time at the end of the day. It also creates a problem for those kids who have a game or a practice <laughs> or a club meeting that their teachers are involved in professional development or the schedule of the games. If they don't start till 3:30, there's nowhere for those kids to go for three hours if it's an early release, and so they're milling around. They're it's not only unsupervised, it's highly irregular and <laughs> unstructured, and if they take the bus home, then they don't have a way to get back, and it just creates another whole issue of transportation and getting kids where they need to go. So if it's a late start on a day in the middle of the week, the week is the most normal as could be in that situation, 
and then the afternoon activities are not disrupted. And I think I'll, you know that's important to a lot of students and parents to know where their kids are every afternoon. And if the kids are counting on having a key club meeting at three o'clock or two thirty when the advisor is available, then they want to be back for it. So you know that would eliminate an entire day of the week where um, clubs could be meeting if if that was the case. If we had had early release, I mean it just crunches the schedule in a different way. So I I think draft five is <coughs> excuse me, I think it's a smart compromise. Um, it still is going to be a little bit of trouble and why one question I have and I don't know yes, Jen is here. Jen Lim, sorry to call you out on this. Um, I know that Google calendars are available on the website and you can download to your calendar. I don't have a student in the high school yet, but are all the high school late starts downloadable? Like are they so everyone has a device now that their calendars are in. So mm -hmm. if you can download it at the start of the year and all the late starts are in it, then some of the mystery is lost because you can look at your calendar and see. Christine, you have some things to say about this? I do. I have a student at the high school. I don't use the downloadable calendar, but when the calendar was made available, I sat down and I opened up my phone and I entered every one of them and I specified whether it was an all late start because sometimes I'll have a parent in the neighborhood say to me, hey, late start tomorrow. And I say, uh, hold on. Oh, no, that's high school only. Or I'll say, oh, that's everybody. You know, sometimes I'll drive by and see kids out at the bus stop and be like, what are they doing there? So, but, but I, yeah, I would imagine it's very customizable. And so the high school only late starts would appear on the high school schedule if you're downloading the high school schedule. Does that, yeah, that sound right? Yeah, I think the late starts are on there. Now. Yeah. Yeah, and as long as you sync it and pull it down, yeah, you should be, it should just add it to whatever your family calendar, your personal right. calendar. Um, Chris just brought up <coughs> now um, Petco is doing or, or driving a community calendar, and maybe we could add the late starts to that. Yeah. So, Jen agrees. And those who came here, because it's not microphone, Jen agrees that it's. The late, the late starts are downloadable and you can choose the calendar you want and add them to the community calendar. So I think but there's still mystery surrounding, you know, week to week people kind of lose track of it, but if I think that could just be like an education piece that comes with the welcome back to the new school year, FYI, you can download your calendar because and I think a lot of people don't know that or don't use it. Christine and click and click here to download. download. Click here now. You don't download it? <laughs> oh. Click here now to download. Very easy. I like Very that easy. link. We'll take lessons. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Gary? <laughs> I agree with what everyone else has said that of the three, I think I prefer draft five. I think it is more predictable, easy to remember. Monday holiday, no late start. Um, and I think one point that is important for parents to keep in mind is that this isn't a forever solution for, to professional development in our district and that next year is an exceptional year for the high school in particular um, and that if we are successful in figuring out how to swap start times um, and change so that the high school consistently <coughs> has a later start time, perhaps elementary having earlier start times, but the whole landscape of, of how professional development fits into our district day might change. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't want parents to think that this is a slippery slope of all Wednesdays always and forever becoming um, changed in this way. Any further discussion, Jeff? I just want to comment that we had a number of individuals email us concerning the cal calendar. And, uh, even when you don't agree with us, it's nice to hear your comments and your suggestions. But what is even better f from my perspective is that you are totally involved in what is happening with your student. And, and that, is, that is what we're here for, all of us, <coughs> to do what we think is best for our students. So even though you, you don't get the answer that you might like each time, please keep those emails coming because it stimulates <laughs> us sometimes to think in a different direction. It truly does. Thank you. Anyone else? Girls, do you have anything you'd like to say on behalf of the high school students? No. Um, can I just ask a question really yes. quickly? So in March for this, yes. I don't know if I just missed this in the little write-up, 
Is that supposed to be every Wednesday in March is a late start? Uh, that's that's w the way it turns out, right. yes. That's really great. <laughs> <laughs> As a high school student, I appreciate that because March is the only month that we don't have a holiday. Right. So, so well, we have a late start every week. So we're like, March is a very long month. Yes, so. <laughs> I hope that, uh, especially for the advanced placement classes, that teachers find a way to get all their materials presented in a way that's not even more stressful and kind of crunched. It's like time. There's a time crunch from the beginning when it comes to AP classes, just because there's so much material that you have to cover and you have to get there before the end of the school year. You have to get there. A month, AP, yeah, a month before the end of the school year. So I just hope that, I know it's only like maybe one more each month or something, mm -hmm. and that's only a little bit of time really off, but mm -hmm. that's, that's just my only concern. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Emma, and I'm sure Mr. Creature heard all of your concerns and wishes for next year's students. So um, are we ready for a vote? I think we are. All in favor. <coughs> Seven plus two. Thank you. We have a calendar. All right. It's been a while. <coughs> and 5.6, the second reading of the proposed FY 2017 budget. And I'm going to let Jody uh, have a few minutes to talk to us about the budget before we move on that. My Great. favorite topic. <laughs> <laughs> I can start having Jack. Um, so I, I'm going to read a brief sort of synopsis on things that may have changed since our first reading, just so everyone can sort of come up with me if you haven't been to our meeting. This year's budget development um, has been goal-driven and collaborative for the Finance Committee. We've made a commitment to meet regularly with the Town Council Finance Committee since January and have worked with the team to develop achievable budget goals to address the needs of the entire community. We've created a budget document using a new narrative format so that citizens can learn more about our schools and how we are making use of our resources. We've developed new avenues of communications with Facebook, Constant Contact, um, a shared town school budget portal. If you haven't been to the portal, I suggest you all go riveting. <laughs> uh, we hope that these efforts will result in a better understanding and appreciation of the complexities of our school budget. In the course of our budget work since the first reading, two areas of concern have been voiced by citizens reaching out to the school board. The, the wish for restoration of seventh grade sports and for the rebuilding of world language classes at grades three through five. As it relates to world language, our school leaders have prioritized rebuilding the capacity to offer consistent language learning starting at the elementary level since the first community dialogue back in 2011. Our rebuilding efforts since the layoffs of the recession years have been slowed by the community's hes hesitancy to increase the school budget much beyond required to simply maintain level services. I am pleased to share with you that this budget does include an increase of $50,000 in the extracurricular budget as a board, it has identified the restoration of seventh grade sports as our first priority for this funding. If you've had a chance to read the budget document, which I'm sure you all have, you'll know that the Athletics and Activities Department advocates for an incremental investment over several years in order to fully fund the cost of existing programs, which are now heavily supported by our booster clubs. For world language, a simple multi-year plan is underway. While we certainly appreciate and fully support proven benefits of language acquisition in early childhood, we have focused in recent years on the need to build capacity at the middle school and high school to support world language graduation requirements. All students will be required to speak and write in a second language in order to graduate. We are currently providing a strong world language foundation at the middle school. The FY 17 budget proposal adds 2.5 teacher positions to increase instructional capacity at the high school level. During the current school year, we piloted a student teacher experience through UNIBE uh, in the Dominican Republic, bringing Spanish-speaking teachers to our K-2 level. 
This program is planned to continue next year and will provide a reciprocal opportunity for Scarborough High School students to study in the Dominican Republic. At Wentworth, in coming years, you are likely to see a blended learning approach to world language learning. This model combines staff resources with one-to-one -one technology to support language learning. Again, the focus is on logical, sequential rebuilding to ensure that the world language instruction can achieve the goal of graduating students with proficiency in a second, maybe even a third language. <coughs> so, with that, thank you. So, does anyone want to discuss that first before we move on? No, I think we need to have. We need to make a motion. Make a motion. <coughs> I move approval to adopt the Leadership Council's budget proposal as it was presented on April 6, 2016 for first reading with the following amendments. Decrease the salary and wage accounts by 67,399 across all personnel categories and increase benefit accounts by 67,399 across all personnel categories. Did I say that right? Increase benefit accounts. Uh, total general fund operating budget will remain $45,855,066 with offsetting non-tax revenue of $6,121,057 and a tax request to the town of $39,734,010. I'll get back in. Did I hear a second from Christine? Very good. Now any discussion? <coughs> And this is a second reading. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Jody, did you want to say something? Yeah, I, I feel like I'm sort of a broken record here, but it really has been an experience for me, for someone who didn't participate in the finance committee last year um, and the joint meetings that happened with the town council, it really has been an incredible experience to see those two bodies working together and, and talking through ideas as a town. Um, at today's meeting, it was, it was even brought up that it seems very obvious that we continue to only dwell on the school budget and we really need to start looking, and in in this was from town councilors, we really need to start looking at the town, not just what is the school budget doing and, and let's talk about it forever and ever and ever, but let's look at this as a town. I think Sean Babine has said over and over, one town, one budget and I couldn't agree more. So it's been, it's been a great experience and I really feel like the work that was put forward last year and continued this year is, is moving this town in the right direction. Anyone else? Yeah. First of all, I want to thank Jody and the Finance Committee. I think your leadership <coughs> uh, continues to inspire us to look at the budget in a different way. And your presentation last evening I thought was very good. I just have a, a suggestion and this came, has come up most recently. Uh, I had a discussion with uh, Chief Moulton about the drug problem. And, and at the present time he can't find money in his budget. And I think we need to work with him on that because what he would really like to do is have some sort of drug education starting at the Wentworth School. And what I suggest is that we as a board and you as a finance committee monitor this budget so that perhaps come January or February we may be able to find enough money to start that process. You know, it's, it's affecting everybody. And the sooner we can and have our children be aware of it, and the sooner we can stop it, uh, the better off we're all going to be as a community. So I just offer that as a suggestion. Anyone else? Or just uh, what, a <coughs> clarification, would that be in addition to the D.A.R.E. program? Yes. So he, we, what his goal would be is to have a person assigned to the Wentworth School and I'm not certain he knows exactly what that would look like, but he wants to work with the board on that so to uh, try and stem the tide in our town. Anyone else? Just a, just a comment, and I think uh, Kelly was getting at it. Uh, there is drug education. I just want people to understand Correct. there is drug education through, throughout the grades, um, starting at Wentworth. Um, but uh, Ms. Perry's point, I think, is that 
uh, all of our efforts need to be intensified uh, to, to address <laughs> the issue, and I, I would agree with that. Well, and, and there was the point five or point four substance abuse counselor in the budget that has now been pushed aside for till the following year. So for me, that's for me that is a is a really significant thing. I I feel badly that that's that's pushed to the side, but uh, you know. I mean, I'll, I'll obviously I'll support what uh, Mr. Creech feels that the high school really needs right now. I, having, having listened to Chief Moulton too on the day that we met with Shelley Pingree's office, um, it was just so clear that the need is here. And it, it doesn't mean necessarily that it's, it's a kid who is doing drugs. All that kid needs to have is a family member who last night or last weekend had a significant event happened, whether it's opioids or, or heroin at this time. And so I think that prevention piece is really, really important for the middle and the high school. So uh, I'm disappointed that that piece is not in there. I have to, I just have to say that. So. Okay, anything else? <coughs> Very good. All in favor? Seven plus two, thank you. I have another motion. Yes. Uh, I move approval to adopt the capital improvements, adult education, and school nutrition budgets as they were presented on April 6, 2016 for the first reading. Second. Any discussion on the capital improvements? I have just one All right. question, if you don't mind. The nutrition director is a shared service with Cape Elizabeth. How is that divided? Is it like a 50-50 split uh, or a 60-40? I think it was a uh, per capita uh, via students, right? Okay. And that's why I come to in bed one. I could mime. Um, it's actually the way that we set it up for the first year is a 60-40 split, and it's based essentially on the population of the students um, and the number of meals that uh, they would be likely to produce in both both districts. I think we've uh, probably gotten a little better than our share because Peter spent a lot of time in our district setting things up and Cape has been running really smoothly because he's been there for years. Um, but that's the way the funding is done and when you see it in the school nutrition budget, you see a salary and benefits line. Mm -hmm. Essentially what I'm doing is just paying an invoice to Cape Elizabeth and they have him on their payroll. And, and we intend to renew that, extend it. We're in the process of having those meetings we're, right now. We're forging some shackles right now to keep it <laughs> locked up. <laughs> we don't want him wandering anywhere. No. no, thank you. I was just wondering because, you know, we're constantly thinking of different ways to have shared services between the town and other towns, and so mm -hmm. I was just wondering how that... Anything else? All in favor? Seven plus two. Thank you. And so now apparently we have an announcement. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> On behalf of the rest of the board, I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank you, Donna, for the incredible work that you've done, particularly with the superintendent search. You fielded untold emails and calls both from us um, late at night, early in the morning from community members. You had to make some calls that sometimes were unpleasant. You had a crash course in journalistic ethics. Um, and we are so incredibly grateful for the work that you did on behalf of the rest of the board and on behalf of the community. Um, we hope you get some much needed R&R &R, and we would like to do what we can to support that and uh, we just really want to go on record as saying how much we appreciate appreciate the work that you did. Well, I'm just flabbergasted. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. I'm, I will definitely put this massage. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's right now or after the budget. <laughs> oh, thank you very much for that. You all worked so hard on that whole process. It was months of work, so it, it certainly wasn't just me. So. Uh, you know, we soon hope to resolve the whole thing and have a superintendent for next year. So, thank you.
All right. So now we have uh, 6.0 oh, workshop. No, 5.7. Appointments for Oh, then I didn't go. With the amendment. With the amendment. Oh, okay, okay. So it's, um, they're basically as, as presented. Mm -hmm. Move the rule as presented. Second. Any questions, Beckham? Yes. Uh, yes. I, we're this is finished. We're this, done. this is the last of the spring appointments. <laughs> Thank you for answering my <laughs> almost yeah. answering my question prior to my asking it, and I appreciate that. Thank you so much. I noticed patterns. <laughs> okay. You find these approvals so tiresome you just need to know when the end is in place? Well, no, it's just kind of wanting to know how many more of these are still out there. Sort of have a running tally. All in, all we all said. Anybody else have any discussions? Be the final chair, sorry. <laughs> all in favor? Seven plus two, thanks. And so now 6.1. So um, a couple of months ago, well, actually several months ago, <laughs> a friend of mine um, had told me that it um, might be helpful to talk to Sue Reed from the Department of Education. She's a consultant and specialist in early childhood education. And I had read a little bit about what was happening around the state in terms of preschools and just felt that it would be really helpful for us to, uh, by the springtime, the end of the school year, have a little bit of information. And, and Sue graciously said she'd be glad to uh, join us one evening and just give us an overview. You know, we haven't talked about this at all. We haven't thought about this much at all. Um, just give us information about what's happening around the state. And Sue we see. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Getting a little remote instruction here. So, um, yeah, I work at the department and I oversee public four-year-old programs in the state of Maine. And part of my job, um, when invited, is to provide information, resources, support. Um, I just come when when asked, um, and I'm happy to support you um, in any way possible. So, what I going to do tonight is go through a pretty quick PowerPoint um, and it, stop me if it's too fast or if you have questions. Um, and then really I think we're going to open it up to questions and answers. Is that correct? So it's pretty informal. I don't mind being interrupted. Just put your hand up. Um, so a lot of you may know this, um, but um, I mean, high quality preschool is good for all kids um, if parents choose to send their children, um, but it's particularly um, impactful on um, well, you know, low income families, children who may not have um, the kinds of experiences um, that other children may have. Um, and we know from the research that when children are in high quality preschool, there is um, the remedial services um, when they get to school um, decrease, um, so it's a cost savings and I think probably most people know that early intervention um, pays off. Um, it is a real significant um, a thing that you can do to kind of close the achievement gap. We now know that um, that the achievement gap is getting wider and wider in our country. Um, and so that is something that uh, preschool can, can work on. Um, and there are funds available um, at the K-2 subsidy rates. I don't know what Scarborough's subsidy is from the state. Probably there not is. much is what I'm guessing. <laughs> you are correct. <laughs> um, so whatever that is at the K-2 level, that is what the pre-K subsidy um, is. <clears throat> um, so you know, you probably know that not all preschool looks the same. Um, there's quite a level of uh, variation in quality. Um, but the other thing is that when a district decides they want to do a public preschool program, it impacts your local businesses because you have folks who are either providing family child care, center child care, 
nursery school, preschool, hardly anyone calls it nursery school anymore, but the idea of just you know a few mornings a week for children at three and four. Um, so when a district decides they're going to do that, to provide public preschool, which is free, um, it, it can and often does have an impact on the local businesses. So um, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But um, there's no, there are no startup funds from the state, um, unfortunately. Um, and then also really just thinking about careful planning. So, you know, I really recommend that a district take a whole year um, to really plan. That's my recommendation, but because um, then I think you really can really gather the information that you need and um, have the time to kind of make various decisions. So. Um, you may have read in, in the paper, some people say, oh, well, preschool doesn't really last. It's kids fade out in kindergarten and first grade. And um, that is true um, in some instances. But we do have research from three states um, that really show impact l much later on. So in New Jersey, um, we have test scores from kids in fifth grade, so kids who have been in preschool, kids who have not, and the difference um, re that higher achievement for the children who attended preschool remaining into fifth grade. Um, Boston, um, they looked at third grade reading scores and again saw um, that half of the children who had attended the pre-K um, had an, um, an increase in the reading scores. And then um, the same with um, North Carolina, and that was also third grade. And then Colorado, you can't really see this, but um, the three lines show reading, writing, and math. It's a little small, but it looks at the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh grade. Um, and you're looking at kids at risk, um, kids who went to pre-K in the middle, and then the state average. So what that's showing basically is that children who went to preschool um, are maintaining that upper, um, close, closer to the state average. And in Michigan, um, they looked at fourth grade, seventh grade, um, and then also looked at retention. Um, and so, again, you can see the difference between children who went to preschool in Michigan. Um, the test scores were higher, math scores were higher, and then the um, difference in the graduation um, rates. Um, so really quickly, this is your like crash course in <laughs> in preschool quality. But in these states, were those what we call those outcomes kind of stuck? They didn't fade out over time. The research really looked at why is that? So why in some places do kids go to pre-K? Then they go to kindergarten, and by the end of kindergarten, everybody looks the same. So what was it about these states that really made those differences stick into fourth, fifth, even twelfth grade? So we have two things when we talk about quality. We have process quality, and that's the quality of the interaction between teachers and children, the quality of the instruction. No big surprise there to a school committee. Um, Evidence-based curriculum that's aligned with learning <coughs> standards, professional development, authentic assessments, and evaluation of the pre-K impact on kindergarten programs. So in some towns where they've never had any kind of preschool, no private preschool, I mean, there are really places in Maine, there's just nothing until kids get to kindergarten. They really start to see a difference in that kindergarten entry when um, they've started a preschool and, and so children. But then teachers need to keep kids moving forward. You can't just stop at kindergarten. So, um, so those are the, you know, very briefly, um, the research around process quality. And then there's structural quality. And so in Maine, um, we have preschool standards now um, that look at class size, the ratio of the child to the teacher, how much time children um, come to, to preschool, so more time, if it's quality, leads to higher outcomes, certainly teacher qualifications, and in Maine we require 
what's called the 081 certification, which is the early childhood certification. Um, and we also require an EdTech 2 in the classroom as well. Um, and then the other piece that really adds is, is the administrator and the principal knowledge of what preschool looks like. Um, so those are just, you know, <coughs> really quick, down and dirty um, look at the kinds of things that really impact long-term outcomes. And the, just to give you some kind of ballpark, the average cost of state-run preschool in the United States is about $7,800 per child. It's all over the place, but that's the average. <laughs> um, so let me just tell you quickly about Maine. Um, about 70% of Maine school districts that have kindergarten have public preschool programs. A little over a third of those are in partnership with either Head Start or local child care or preschool programs. Um, as I said, um, as of this past fall, this school year, our standards went into effect for, um, for the 2015-16 um, years for those new and expanded programs. In 2017-18, every preschool program in the state will have to meet the 124 standards. Um, and I will just say many, many districts have been meeting these for years. They were in recommended form since 2007. Um, so, um, you know, they, they've been around, but just not in law. Sir, yes? I heard you say as of 2017-18, all preschool programs must be public, public sorry, thank you, thank you for <laughs> left that out, all public preschool programs. Private preschool programs are subject to licensing, which falls under the Department of Health and Human Services, different departments. And we have, um, we have our own set of standards that align with Maine's K-12 standards. Um, we just um, revised those last year, <coughs> and so um, we expect that pr public preschool programs will align their curriculum and their assessments to the early learning and development standards. Um, and we have written them, they're on our website, but um, we've written them in such a way that you can see the alignment into kindergarten. Um, so, um, these are sample steps to developing a program. I've had some conversations with Donna. There's not one right way. The, you know, it's, this is all very local, um, but here are some of my recommendations. Take them or leave them. Um, so talk to school board. Okay, I guess we're doing a check, right? <laughs> Got that one done. Um, one of the things I think is a great thing to do is to gather data um, from your current kindergartners. And so who went to preschool and where did they go? And maybe you already collect that on your incoming kindergarten form, but that is great data to have. To, to know where kids have been or who hasn't been anywhere. Um, the next piece um, is around convening your local providers. Um, so your, um, oh, and I was going to send that to you, Donna. That's okay. Out of the I'll office, but I will. I will, um, <coughs> I will send Donna the link on how you get the list of the providers in Scarborough. <coughs> But my recommendation is that you are up front from the beginning, and again, these are my recommendations, with local providers because you, will ha you may have an impact on their business. Um, yes? Do you have any data about um, the shift that happens in communities where there was no public but very well established private, then they integrated public? Do you have any sense of... of what percentage or numbers end up moving from a private provider to a public system? I don't, I only have anecdotal data. <laughs> um, and it does impact, I mean, it, they, people leave um, their local because why wouldn't you? You're right, it's free. I don't have a sense, I know, I know the areas where there have been huge problems, where providers have been so upset that they've gone to their legislators. Um, I mean, these are people's businesses, and some people have been in their business for a really long time, and so, so my data is more anecdotal, um, but there are some pockets of the state where that has been very impactful, and people have been very upset. Is there so anything in common with those? Is, are those a certain demographic where that's been a very significant 
I think it's probably a demographic where it's more of an um, where there are more providers in the community, and it's typically I'm going to say not I'm going to qualify that, but from what I can think of now, it's more in more affluent communities. Yes. Do you frequently see a lot of collaboration between the local providers and the school districts that are trying to start up the, pub the public pre-K? So I can think of how. So we encourage that. Yes. Um, and, and even though that may not happen in the first year, we encourage that kind of collaboration. Again, those are local decisions. Um, but there are some very successful collaborations. RSU One um, has a collaboration with a Head Start, a child care program, two child care programs, um, a, a preschool program, and then have two programs in their schools. Now that did not happen overnight. That was a long time coming. But what that did for parents was allow them to make choices. So say I'm a parent who needs I need all day because I'm working. The schools collaborated with that program, and I'll tell you what has to be in place before you do that, but, and, and was able to contract for some preschool slots. So that, in other words, the child's kind of in preschool in the morning and then stays all day. Other parents don't need that, and so a morning program at the school works for them. So I'm always encouraging <laughs> districts to look at their communities and what are the needs of the people in the community. You know, what do you, where do you have and where do you have unmet needs? But, but good question. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so you don't have Head Start in Scarborough, so you can check that off your list. Um, you do, um, so the other thing you need to know about preschool if you don't is it does not, in Maine, <laughs> Um, the three to five year old special ed falls under a separate entity. Okay, so your school special ed starts at K, but the special ed for three to five year olds falls, or three until kindergarten, falls under what's called child development services. And so those folks need to be at the table pretty early on because we require an MOU, a memorandum of understanding with Child Development Services because they are responsible for IDEA and child find and provide, they provide all of the special services that children may need at that age. So that's a good thing from a district budget perspective because <laughs> they have to cover those costs until children get to kindergarten. Um, there are other things that aren't so good, but, um, but that's a piece. So if you have children with special needs um, and they're in those programs, CDS covers those costs. Um, I, again, I just recommend that you become familiar with Chapter 124 and our online application. And I am available anytime, email, phone calls, anything, if you have questions. My job really is to help a community have a successful preschool program. So it's not, even though we have an application, I tell people, it's not like applying to college and like you're going to like not get it, right? <laughs> we work with a district to make sure that you have everything in place to have a successful program. Um, so I think I already said that, yeah. So that's me. So this is my quick, really quick um, presentation and our website. So I'm really happy to kind of entertain questions or whatever you want to know. So I, I have a yeah. few. Okay. Um, so I've heard that there are some towns that are um, deciding to have preschool um, because the enrollment is going down. Oh yeah. <laughs> and so Very what are the so. what are the big advantages that would happen there? Well, again, I think these are towns that probably get more subsidy than than. Um, Scarborough does, but the motivation for them is is money from the state. I mean, they're gonna they're losing on the other end, and so they're gonna increase their enrollment, you know, at the early end and increase their state subsidy. So, I that's my best answer to that question. I think you know, mm -hmm. um, but that's um, there are many many places in Maine where um, the enrollment is declining severely, um, and so that's a real. Can you give us an idea of um, the, you know, the differences in the towns in terms of 
some examples of programs that they would put into place, say for just those kids who don't get to go to private mm -hmm. schools in their town? So again, these are all local decisions, but there are some towns that target which children they want to bring into their public preschool. Perfectly legal. I I suggest you be very transparent about what that is. But for example, I will give Portland as an example. Portland offers public preschool, but 70% of the children who can attend that preschool have to be free and reduced lunch. And then the other 30% are community people. So that's something they put into place because there are a lot of programs in Portland and they <coughs> felt like they really wanted to target the kiddos who parents could not afford a private preschool. Um, there are places that are all free and reduced lunch. I mean, they limit it. Or they hold a certain number of, of um, spaces for children with special needs. There, you know, as I said to you, Donna, there is not one right way to do it. Um, you really want to look at the needs of your town and what you think the kids who, um, who may be coming, you know, are. But there's, it's all over the place. <laughs> Local control state, right? <laughs> so. I don't know if that answered your question, but yeah. Anyone else? I have a question, but I don't know if anyone here can answer. How does South Portland do it? Because I know they have, it seems like it's through the town. Mm -hmm. South Portland has two public pre-K classrooms, um, and they, one has been around for, I want to say, five years, and the other one maybe three years. And they got a grant to do startup or they had some money from some other grant. I, I actually, before I was at the department, I actually was the consultant to starting that program. Um, so they had some seed money. They started and they, I believe, target who comes <coughs> to be sure that they have a um, income. And then is it lottery after that? I, I think, think so, like yeah. Lottery or something. Yeah. So one of their classrooms is actually at the Opportunity Alliance building down by, um, you know, where the youth center was, and they're actually going to move out this year, but they didn't have any space. And then their other program is at Kaler, but they were really trying to target kids who didn't have anything um, and, and then do a lot, and Portland does a lottery too. And what's the preschool at the rec center? Is that their community services, just providing oh, a... Hmm, it's good to know about that. I know Cape has a rec, kind of a rec center preschool thing. I, I, I didn't know South Portland did, but. And then there's the whole thing about transportation. Do you provide transportation? Do you not? That's completely up to the community, um, not required. And I do want to make sure I say that because there has been a lot of um, misunderstanding about that, that you have to provide up a transportation and you do not have to provide transportation. So. I was curious but, um, when you mentioned bringing all of the local providers to the table. What does that look like? What's the goal of that? Is it just for transparency's sake to let them all know what's going on? Is there any attempt to sort of um, even out the education that you know, the preschool education that different kids would be getting? Are you trying to align anything like um, encourage? I know you can't force obviously the private providers to do any certain thing, but. Are you nudging them in any direction? <laughs> um, well, let me just first say that in order to partner with a public school, a private yeah. provider has to meet some, it's just not anybody, right? We're talking about you know, your local tax dollars and we're not just going to give them to Joe Schmall, right? So in order to be able to, to partner, that program has to be accredited, nationally accredited. And then it, it goes on a kind of a star level, almost like a AAA rating. That from the NAYC. That's the NAYC. And then, in addition to that, they also have to have a certified teacher on staff. So that eliminates, I mean, you do have some accredited centers, I believe, in Scarborough. Um, and I was going to get that for Donna, and I will get it for you tomorrow. But um, so, you, so that eliminates some folks, um, although some that may, um, motivate some folks to want to become accredited and to become accredited you're really raising the quality of um, you know of that program so to answer your question I think again not to sound like a broken record but it kind of depends so I'll just give you an example Wyndham Raymond um, I've been working with this year they are looking at starting the program next year 
they called their folks together and they actually had three accredited sites. They are going to target in their first year of operation, they're going to target children who are at free and reduced lunch. So probably children who could not afford, whose parents could not afford to send them to the other places. But they are open to, in the future, because they don't have any space in Wyndham, to perhaps partner with some of these, these programs. So what happened, though, that was so interesting at that meeting is that they all decided they really wanted to get together and share professional development. Mm -hmm. And so this little community for I, I didn't expect that to happen, but um, the school was doing something. They invited all the pre-K folks to the, and then one of the private preschools was having an event, invited, um, and, you know, well, invited some kindergarten teachers, but eventually would invite a pre-K teacher. So that's a great thing to happen. Um, but mostly I recommend it for transparency. Um, and you may not, you don't have to have all your plans out on the table, but when you do call people together, you probably want to have some idea of maybe where you're going um, so that folks, <coughs> The tone of that of these meetings, they start out very, people are nervous. <coughs> um, but depending on how it's presented and how um, input is taken in, you know, it, it, it can be okay. Um, yes? So in the case of this Wyndham example, mm -hmm. um, targeting students, for instance, who aren't free and reduced lunch, in that case then, do they attend the preschool of the no. See, these are mostly kids who haven't been anywhere. Right, but, yeah. but you're yeah. saying they partner. You partner with a private oh, preschool. Oh. Do then they go to that private preschool? No. In Wyndham, that they're going to start their own classroom in Raymond. Actually, in 14, they're going to start a classroom in the Raymond Elementary School. N nothing to do with these other kiddos. So, what point. does the partnership then look like with the private accredited institutions? So it could it. It allows the district to have more four-year-old students and have a collaboration with that. So in other words, that uh, one of those kids might go to that school or they might go to the, the program at the school. Um, Is it the case that then the school Pays a subsidy to Correct. the private. Correct. Okay. Great. And is, is that a 100 percent? That is no. Nope, that is totally negotiated between the school and the private program. So, uh, an example up north. I won't tell you where, but there's this, there was a situation where the school kept opening classrooms and pulling kids <laughs> away from this private provider, pri private preschool. This year, we were able to get to a place where the school actually purchased two slots because. The hours were different, and so parents really wanted their child in this private program because they didn't want to be transitioning, you know, at noon or whatever. Mm -hmm. So next year they're going to buy six slots. Um, so all of that is completely negotiated between the school and the provider, and it doesn't mean that you give a hundred percent of the cost. That that all gets. It's all for you to work out. <laughs> um, um, so you yeah. had mentioned, did you say it was eight to one, um, eight to one on the teacher ratio? Yes. Um, so that's a requirement. Mm -hmm. And then there's an ed tech in there too. Correct. So there's an 081 teacher, certified teacher, and an ed tech for 16 kids. And that would be like for typically how many hours and how many days? So again, that's all over the place in Maine. The, the requirement is to have an approved preschool is 10 hours a week. So we have everything in Maine from 10 hours a week to all day and everything in between. Some, some districts do three mornings a week, some do four mornings a week, some do mornings and afternoons, some do two days, some do five days. I mean, it is, it is all over the place. Um, and as long as you're coming, if children are coming 10 hours a week, however you divide that up, you meet the, the standard. So would it be just eight and the teacher and the ed tech in one classroom? You need a certain number of square footage to yeah. meet? Yeah, so you need 35 square feet per child, which is not very much, but we decided to make it consistent with licensing. It's the size of a double bed mattress, that's what I always say to people. <laughs> Um, uh, just a, for yeah. our staff, um, yeah. how many students did we take in the summer programs, Anne, that we ran in August to jumpstart? Um, jump jumpstart. Start. Summer we did 65. We invited 65. Yeah. Um, and then in the summer we did 
And, and 65 came? Um, well, no, probably not all 65 came the whole time, but 65 people signed up and probably 59 or 60 of them actually participated in the entire. And those 65 students had, had no private? No, absolutely not. A lot of them had private preschool. This, our, our summer program is, because Scarborough has such a wealth of preschool and, and pre-K opportunities, there's no way we can limit it to people who didn't have it. Initially, that program, when it was first developed, was targeted at that population, but it's evolved in Scarborough to be more of a, um, a transition and a way of practicing kindergarten and, and, and other opportunities, um, not so much kids who've never been to preschool. This year, when we um, did our initial registration with parents online, we asked them all what preschools their children attended, right. and only 11 out of the 175 that filled in the form had answered nothing. So either no or left it blank. Um, so there's very few that actually don't go to any sort of mm -hmm. daycare, preschool, you know, something. So if you, if you offered one class of eight children, we would probably have find those children. We would hope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We would hope. Um, you know, Bestworth had, the Red program had a preschool program for a long time until the building changed. And they no longer have their four-year-old program. And so I can't speak to it anything except for the fact that it existed and it hasn't existed since it was torn down. <laughs> but um, they, we did have we did have public preschool in that regard and it was a community run program. We didn't have anything to do with it as a school, but it was not free. And it wasn't free. It was not free. Yeah. We didn't yeah. run it. Yeah. And so it was competitive as far as I recall, Best Worth was they um, this is what I remember in our conversations about whether or not it was going to stay is that Best Worth tuition was um, equal to or greater than the lowest cost preschool in town of the private preschool. That's pretty typical of rec preschools, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the other thing that I would ask, are you, you must be kindergarten <coughs> teachers. No. <laughs> oh, oh, administrative. <laughs> so, um, the other thing is really looking, I'm assuming you are screening kindergartners when they come in and, um, you know, looking at that data as compared to where kids are coming from, um, because I'm going to gather that some kids are more ready than others. Um, so that's another piece of, um, you know, data collection in terms of looking at, do you feel like there are some of those kids that, r regardless of whether they've been in pre-K or not, do they um, do they need more in kindergarten? Absolutely. Yeah. And we do screen kids that have already been identified by CDS, even though the whole point of screening is <laughs> to do child find, mm -hmm. they've already been found. They've been found, right. <laughs> so we still yeah. screen many, many of them. Um, and I think what we find here in Scarborough, at least in my 12, 13 year <laughs> history here, is that the kid who really could benefit from from services or identification or preschool that don't have it typically show up in August. You know, they don't want to be found. They're mm -hmm. doing what they're doing. They're just moving in. They're, you know, they're people who don't have a real solid foundation of where they're living or whether they're working. Um, so it, the ones that we see typically yeah. show up in August. So we wouldn't have been able to find them when they were poor anyway. <laughs> But, Although if screening is required in four-year-old programs, and so some schools use that as a way to get those kiddos earlier. Um, so they'll have a screening as a part of the registration process. And again, there's no one right way to do it. But then, you know, the idea being if a child does need services, you're getting those services in preschool before children get to kindergarten. So. You know, but it, you, I really recommend doing exactly what you do, which is looking at your data and where are kids and where are the common areas of developmental need. Um, yeah. This may be beyond your purview, oh. but is there a uh, is there a model in the state of, for instance, a privately endowed scholarship fund for pre-K? 
for kids in need in the community, something that might be held within the district and then those funds could be applied for and made available? I don't know of anything, but I can ask. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Janet? I have a question about the number of hours. I'm confused. We could offer preschool for 10 hours a week mm -hmm. and get $7,800. No, 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 that, no, 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 that no, would say no. US, that would like, say, why would we be offering 20? <laughs> no, that's the United, that's the US average. Okay. Um, in okay. Maine, the average okay. is around $5,700, And we'd get, but we'd only get our and subsidy. And you'd get, so you would get only get it through your subsidy. 11 which cents on the dollar. Which isn't much, I guess. <laughs> Correct. My we, we would lose money, <laughs> Jody. Yeah. It would cost. We'll and so if we did two half day programs, a morning program and an afternoon program, do we get it we get that per child? Correct. Correct. We're only getting a You get a full time equivalent. So so a lot of districts have a morning and an afternoon program no. because you get thirty two kids instead of but their subsidies probably their ninety sub cents their on the dollar. Yeah, but they're also increasing their subsidy because their enrollment's going up. Correct. Correct. But by a lot more than ours. Ours is only going to go up. You know. But it's not just straight costs. We're also going to be saving money down the line in remedial services. Yeah. So it's not. It's depending on depending on how many kids don't go to private Correct. preschools. When you look at what but Anne just said, and she said that out of the hundred and how many? I'm sorry. There were 11. But yeah, that doesn't I, mean they're all coming in, even Steven. No, that's why right. I asked that's about the, that's the issue. Right. I mean, my son is a perfect example. He utilized CDS <coughs> before school started. And so if he could utilize that, if we could have figured it out earlier, he might not have needed to use it K through 2, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. Graduating in second grade. So yeah. there might have been cost savings for the district there because he yeah. got his help now, there. Now, was he able to do access, at, and I can't remember how old Ben is, but um, access the Jump Start program? Um, it just started when he was I Out think, of coming kindergarten. into kindergarten and it was more targeted at that point than it was okay. now. Mm -hmm. All right, because I know a lot of kids Those who've accessed kids. that, right. we've seen their growth in some of the presentations you did early on mm -hmm. in the year of where they started and where they were mm -hmm. and where they ended up. Mm -hmm. So obviously, I would have loved to. Like, right. I remember sitting here during those presentations, being like, "Oh, why didn't we get into that?" Because it's it a great program. Like such a great program. It's a great yeah. program. But yeah, I mean, I think I would be like, I, because all preschools are not created equal. So I would be interested, just because a kid had been in a place for right. however many years, doesn't necessarily mean they're going to come any more ready than, you know, another right. child. So. I almost wonder if there's a way to get together all of our local preschools and sit down. Yeah. I think you Come have, to our podium. Right? Come to our podium. Right. <laughs> there you did. Right. right. I, thought, oh, okay. I thought you did. And I just don't know what the results were. The ands are coming because we did this together. Uh -uh. Okay. <laughs> so great. You're way ahead of the oh, game. Here, here, not behind. Oh, my. So the last three months we have spent um, several, many hours many at the hours. library in a consortium with local preschool programs and the library housing it so it was a neutral ground and nobody felt like you know, it was our meeting or their meeting, it was That's a great. mutual meeting. So we had, um, we had several meetings just to develop some ideas of, of what parents needed for coming into kindergarten that we were not doing well communication wise and things like that and then we invited all the local preschools and daycares to come to meetings one that was at noon and one was in the evening so that they could choose which they could attend and we had I think uh, we had a really no good representation I think um, there were only a couple of the bigger ones in town that didn't come but uh, a lot of the smaller preschools and, and little folk farm and all the well-known ones um, attended and it was a great opportunity to talk about what kindergarten was looking for versus what preschool thinks that we're looking mm -hmm. for and a great opportunity to talk about what they can tell parents to help get their kids ready and it was also a great opportunity for them to connect to each other so your idea of the, the professional development one thing that came out of it was um, a referral from an OT to come to do some professional development with their preschool program about the 
the OT's needs and, and importance of OT such, uh, issues in preschool. Um, so that's one thing that they hopefully have already done. I mean, I, we stepped back once it became yeah. theirs. So yeah, <laughs> but yeah, it has, that has started this year that's in Scarborough, great. so it's great. And yeah, I hope that wonderful. they will move in their own you know, world in their direction without us and that we, were, we agreed to meet twice a year just to keep touching base and to keep connected. Because I guess my curiosity was if there was a way you could say, now these are really things that we're looking for to come out and enter into our kindergarten that you could perhaps shore up in your preschool. We did. That's exactly what yeah. we did. And um, they were relieved to hear that we weren't all about the academics. They were excited to hear that we were uh, about playing and turn taking and sharing and learning to not be the winner all the time and learning not to be first all the time and <laughs> learning to, to be in a group of people to have to wait for adult attention and so those in our opinion in our kindergarten teachers opinion those are far more important skills than letters and numbers those are wonderful we're not going to deny that but you know the social emotional piece and the physical development are just as important and things that get sort of forgotten in a community that's very highly educated and have parents who are very involved with their kids' lives and very um, interested in their kids' achievement and their learning, which is great, you know, but sometimes we tend to forget that you need to learn to lose, you need to learn to be second or third or 19th. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. Personal skills. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Zipping, buttoning, <laughs> wiping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all important. All a little, little bit of important. humility and privacy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it was also a really neat opportunity to link the preschools and the K's and the library. We have a great early childhood librarian in Scarborough, and it, it was it was. So that's exactly what we did, okay. and it was it was great because they were relieved to hear it. We invited them to come to screening. Anybody who came to the meeting, we did have a few people take us up on that. They showed up. They wanted to watch screening. They wanted to see what we were doing. I told a story that probably 10 years ago, uh, we had a whole group of kids come into kindergarten screening saying, I did that at school last week. And the preschool had done the exact same screening tool that we were doing. So our results were completely <laughs> skewed because they learned about how to build that tower and count those blocks and describe that car, you know, a week earlier. They were like, darn, why did we do that? <laughs> so, you know, it was not that it was a big deal, but we asked them not to do our screening tool. <laughs> None of them were, luckily, so it wasn't a problem. Thank so it you. sounds like you have already a great relationship with the providers. That's great. We have a relationship. Okay, you have a relationship. I would say, I mean, I think it improved. Yeah. A lot of communication okay. happened and a couple of connections were made among that group, but I think it's going to be good to keep, we'll do it about once or twice a year to, in preparation for kindergarten information night. So. Have you asked them at all to, sh or do they share information on children with parent permission, of course? With you, on we do. Time. Yeah, okay. we do ask. Yeah. We do uh, have yeah. parents sign a release as part okay. of the registration yeah. packet, and we do send out questionnaires to daycares do. okay. and preschools. Okay. And oftentimes, they don't get it back to us in time for us to help us with class placement, but it can help the teacher mm -hmm. in the fall when they can read through it and see. Oh yes, this is not new behavior. Or, yeah. Oh yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Great. Anyone Great. else? Anything for so? I want another quick point about CDS um, and the special needs kids. I believe that it's true, in my personal experience it was true, that CDS, if a child is identified as having some special needs, doesn't mean CDS is going to cover the entirety of their preschool education. No, no, it's going no. to cover what they need specifically. And in some cases that is the entirety of their preschool education, depending on how severe um, the, the situation might be. But like my son has speech. CDS pays for speech, because I pay preschool. Speech. Correct. And most programs that CDS is paying for are special purpose programs that are all children with severe special needs. Um, the only thing that um, sometimes comes up in public four-year-old programs is an additional ed tech. So say you had four or five kids with special needs and it made sense from CDS's perspective in terms of what they needed to, to pay for an additional person in that class. That happens all the time. Um, they're moving away from that one-on-one because -on -one, it's 
A, really expensive, and, and they can't find people, basically. But, but yeah, no, good point. Pay for the services. Right, not the, the kids who's in the CDS yeah. category doesn't mean you can say, well, they're free. <laughs> no. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Um, as an insider at DOE, um, <laughs> uh, you probably, you probably uh, know that um, the whole future of CDS at one point was, was really questionable yep. and whether or not, and the plan really was, and I think it was sort of a good plan, yep. was to Absolutely. really um, move uh, those responsibilities to the local districts. Yep. A place like Scarborough would be, yep. would be very good at that. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when we talk about preschool, we, we were always thinking about that as a, as a possibility because it, it seemed as though it was almost inevitable. Um, all of the new construction um, in, at elementary level um, for an elementary school um, starts with pre-K, space for pre-K mm -hmm. um, being built into the design. Uh, and I think that was part of that discussion as well. Is that, is that still well, that's kind a of the topic or...? I would say that comes up, I mean, it hasn't come up since I've been at the department, but I've only been there a couple years. Um, every time that's raised, that gets, I mean, so political. But, but one thing I do want to say is that a school can provide those services and be reimbursed. So if you had a public pre-K and you had three kids who needed speech therapy and you wanted to use your own speech therapist because of the continuity, you could do that and bill CDS. And in fact, they like it when you do that because mm -hmm. it's, um, but, uh, but in some schools, that person has no nothing on their caseload open, right? They're just swamped. So that's not the same as 49 other states, which, um, <laughs> <laughs> gotta love Maine, which start special education services at age three. So if you were in Massachusetts and you had a three-year-old who you had concerns about, you go to your public school. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean they have a preschool program, but they are responsible for child fine, for screening, for evaluation. Um, so the answer is, I think that will come up again and again, but I haven't heard rumblings of it lately. So. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very you. welcome. Thank you. Thank you. We well, you've got a great coming this evening. Good. Thank Appreciate you for inviting thank me. Thank you so much. <laughs> and <laughs> and 7.0, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Very good. All in favor? <laughs> Seven plus two.